Hello, wild people. Welcome to AK Wild One. Today, I'm making a 60 mile fat bike ride to an Alaska ghost town. Why don't you join me? So the plan is to bike in 60 miles, spend a couple nights in McCarthy, go up to uh, the Kennecott Mine, and uh, return home. So thank you for joining me. Okay, I'm, I'm here on the uh, Cuscalana Bridge which uh, definitely was one of the major engineering accomplishments of the Copper River and Northwestern Railway. Um, they built this in the winter of 1910. They finished it on New Year's Eve, New Year's 1911. Um, they built the bridge from opposite ends and uh, workmen had to endure temperatures that were down 50 below and even more. So it's quite a feat. Just imagine working at 50 below, uh, welding and putting together the Cuscalana Bridge. It spans a beautiful gorge. see down the Cuscalana Gorge here. Beautiful ice falls there. Beautiful river in spring and summer. So um, behind me here is the Gilahina Trestle and this is about 30 miles in so we're about 30 miles to McCarthy and uh, a trestle is generally something that crosses over land, although there is a creek here and a bridge, uh, like the Cuscalana, uh, crosses over water. A little bit about the McCarthy Road. It's an old rail bed um, that's been turned into a road. Uh, used to be railroad tracks were here. Between 1911 and 1938, uh, the trains moved from Cordova up to McCarthy, Kennecott. So 60 miles from the town of Chitna to McCarthy, and then another five miles to Kennecott. And my intent is to go to McCarthy and uh, then also take a ride up to Kennecott. Uh, like I said, the, road, the railroad ran between 1911 and 1938. Uh, the engineer was known as Mike Haney. Uh, pretty, pretty tough go get him kind of attitude. He was also known as the Irish Prince. He built also the White Pass Railway from Skagway toward Lake Bennett, um, Lake Bennett in the Yukon. And uh, he was definitely a go-getter. He had a saying that if you give me enough dynamite and snus, I can build a road to hell. And uh, snus is chewing tobacco. And lots of, lots of tall stories about him he didn't allow drinking, you know, his three thousand, two to 3,000 men who worked on the railroad, he didn't allow drinking. That wasn't, you know, when you're dealing with dynamite, that's probably not a good thing. What could, you know, what could possibly go wrong? Um, but one time he had an incentive program, and basically at the other end, um, his men were blowing, a, blowing, a, blowing the rock to make a tunnel, and apparently he put a case of whiskey on the other side, and he said, gentlemen, See how fast you can get through this rock with a tunnel and then the whiskey's yours. And so apparently they made it through there in record, record time. So the, the railroad was built to move copper ore from Kennecott to Cordova and then it um, was shipped to Tacoma for further refining. And somewhere between 200 and 300 million dollars worth of copper ore was taken out of here. Um, prices during World War I for copper went very high, for copper bullets and for um, electrical wires. You know, America was becoming electrified at that time. And uh, then 1938, just on the verge of World War II, um, the mine closed. 
And one thing they say about some of the places and, you know, some of the buildings left up in Kennecott that we'll see in a while, uh, they just, people just left. I mean, they left China out on the tables. They left books in the bookshelves. They left clothes. When it was done, it was done. And so people left in 1938. One thing I didn't really plan on, I was kind of, I didn't, I brought two liters of water. Any more would be heavy. But uh, getting fresh water is kind of a challenge because right along the rivers or the creeks here, there are little snow bridges. And unless I want to get wet, um, I guess it's not going to happen. So. I thought I could lower my pot in the water, take my shoes, shoelaces off, and lower my pot in the water, but you know, what could possibly go wrong with that little plan? Uh, I guess, guess I'll just hope that I'm gonna come across some water farther along the trail. Let's see what happens. See the glaciers over there <laughs> along the road. Probably gonna run into this quite a bit. <laughs> this road lasts 30 miles. Well, this looks like a fun, muddy section. A little breakup, Alaskan breakup. So I'll try to keep from taking a mud bath here. a moment that I'm not too proud of and this falls in the category of don't do this at home. Oh by the way look at the beautiful crystalline mountains back there. There's lots of snow and there's some rivers but the, unfortunately the rivers have a lot of snow along the banks and I don't feel like climbing down them and uh, you know having them collapse and getting my feet wet. So I'm about out of water and I need another two liters to get me to the destination. So looks like there's some water flowing from flowing from the glaciers and the trees across across the road here. Looks pretty clean. So I'm gonna take my Sawyer squeeze and get some water. Kind of reminds me of the one time I had to draw water from a cow pasture in the Sierra. I haven't gotten sick yet. We'll just see what happens. So remember, don't try this at home. Okay, well, I've heard the saying the trail provides. In this case, it's the road provides. Okay, there's my water. Doesn't look too bad. I think it's better in cow pasture. It's definitely going to be cold. <laughs> All right. I know I could have pulled over and probably um, melted some snow water, but my pace isn't, I'm not going as fast as I wanted to. 
and uh, so I'm already going to probably get to my destination at dark, so it's best that I just keep going. Well, we're all watered up, and it uh, kind of reminds me of the famous words of the great American philosopher Clint Eastwood, I think, who said, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. Or, even higher up in the philosophical pedigree, Bert Gummer from Tremors, he said, a man, what did he say? He said, I do what I can with what I got. Oh well, 25 more miles, and it's a slog right now, and I was told about this, so it's really punchy and slushy, and I guess I'll just take my time and uh, enjoy being alive. You know, this is definitely one of those times where you got to embrace the suck, because <laughs> it's kind of a sloggy, slushy mess right now. All this road is in the sun, and so it's warmed up and it's pretty slushy, but oh well, it is what it is. Well, we're out of the slosh and uh, on the ice, but actually the ice is not a problem. Ice is actually kind of fun with studded tires on my fat bike. I uh, haven't slipped or anything, so I guess it's better than having potholes. So, uh, anyway, all's going well. Sure is quiet out here. First 30 miles of the road, encountered a little traffic. Now I feel like I'm all alone out here, which is fine. Got about 15 miles to go at mile 45 right now. 15 miles to go. Still think I'm gonna probably get to the cabin around dark. Right now the road is uh, icy and flat and actually pretty good. I don't have any problem with this. Hopefully all the slushy, post-holy, punchy snow is done. Anyway, it's really peaceful and quiet. Every time I stop, I just, I can't hear a single thing. Maybe a squirrel or a couple of birds. Well, well, people, good morning. Uh, I got in late last night. My little bike ride turned into a 12-hour ordeal. Uh, the roads were a little slushy and icy and slower than I expected, but that's the way it works. When I got into the cabin last night, I just crashed, and it was, it was dark. It was definitely dark, and uh, I just basically, I basically went to bed without even eating dinner, which if you know me, that's a big deal because I generally don't like to miss meals. So this morning for breakfast, for some reason, I'm going to have some pan thai rice noodles with American shrimp sauce and peanuts. So one of the things I've noticed is I sent a box ahead um, to the owners of this cabin and uh, they delivered it to me. And I've got way too much food. I have enough food probably to last a week. It's almost embarrassing. I just don't like to starve. Um, when I'm on the trail, long distance trail, I've been able to carry no more than an extra day's worth of food. But I don't know. Um, First day of the first big trip of the year, perhaps I was a little ambitious. Um, I texted Flash last night and said, you know, I'm not 62 anymore, so maybe I better take it easy. I probably should have trained a little bit more um, on my bicycle. I've done a lot of walking, but maybe not enough biking. And uh, I think I was hurting a little bit. So today, got a day of rest. Uh, a little bit of a rest. I think we'll go up to 
about, I think it's about six miles away. We'll go to the, the ghost town of Kennecott and uh, take a look around there. So here's the cabin I stayed in last night. I was a little too tired to film. I got in pretty late anyway, so nice cabin. Take you inside and just show you around. More than enough. Got a nice bed, a few antiques, propane heater, a sink. Uh, wastewater probably goes outside somewhere in a drain field. Uh, the owners left me five gallons of water. They've got a stove, but I, I use my own. I've got my own. I don't know, just kind of grown accustomed to it. Here's my fat bike and uh, some games and some books. I don't think I'll be playing any games. Oh, Operation. Well, look at that. Game Operation. That, that could be fun. Anyway, here's another shot of the cabin. Pretty nice. Yep, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to have. It was really nice to just come in here and fall asleep. Oh my goodness. So uh, we'll look here at the cute little outhouse. You know, Alaskans take a little pride in their outhouse. So it's got mosquito netting, some reading materials over here. And some antiques, look at that, manual typewriter. Wow, how many of you guys remember typing on a manual typewriter? You had to make sure you didn't make any mistakes while you were typing, otherwise it would be a pain to correct them. Now, words come too easily. And historical picture, historical picture, TP, anyway, pretty cute. Well, good morning again, and uh, I'm out on the road to Kennecott, and uh, this is this is the way I'm headed. You can see beautiful mountains, light hitting the hitting the mountain back there, and uh, I don't know. It's about I think it's about six miles or so, so most of it's uphill, but it'll be fun coming back. So this is what I got to look forward to. I'll be honest with you, um, I've walked a little bit of this hill, at least half of it, and uh, maybe that's because I got a little bit of a sore butt from yesterday, and uh, I actually I actually prefer walking to bike riding sometimes. It just seems to use up less energy, but I guess, you know, hiking the Pacific Crest Trail will do that to you, you know, if you're doing a long distance backpacking trip. It's a good idea that you enjoy walking. Um, yeah. Oh, water tastes good. It's kind of amazing, you know, you get out here and really appreciate water. Really appreciated that bed yesterday, a warm cabin. I think uh, spending time outside beating yourself to a pulp kind of uh, instills or inflicts a sense of gratitude. Um, anyway, we're pretty close to Kennecott, uh, just past uh, some cabins along the way. And of course I was greeted by some dogs, but luckily I checked it out. They were, they were friendly. I kind of talked to the people who own the cabin I'm staying in and they assured me the dogs were friendly, which is a good thing. Um, I love dogs, but every so often you come across one with an attitude that wants to take a bite out of you, so I didn't want that to happen.
I can honestly say with a great deal of confidence that I'm probably the first tourist uh, who's been here in 2024. Uh, there's a few people who live up here. Uh, thankful for the snow machine tracks that uh, led me up here. Anyway, we'll go for a little tour of the town. Guide operation here. They do glacier tours. They hike to Root Glacier, which is a few miles away, and uh, put on crampons and go out on the glacier. It's a good time. Go by some of the buildings here. right by the post office, which I believe is closed. And that's kind of cool. Anyway, very quiet and peaceful out here right now. And if you look over there, there's a raven up there. I wonder if I can call it. Sometimes ravens can be a little snobby for something at the bottom of the food chain. I don't know. One day, sometimes they answer me, but apparently not today. They got better things on their mind. Okay, and so here is the pretty famous Kennecott Mill building. And uh, you can actually go on tours there. The Park Service is trying to stabilize it. And... Um, Basically, ore between 1911 and 1938, ore came off the mountains um, in these long trams that almost look like little ski lifts. So at the top, there were giant crushers that would crush the copper ore. And then by the time it reached the bottom, um, most of the copper, usable copper, was refined out. I remember interviewing a, a man who worked here when he was younger than 18 and he accidentally fell into one of those crushers and the foreman pulled him out and then yelled at him. So this is an old mining town, Kennecott. Uh, it, you can call it a town, but really it was a work camp. These workers, these guys worked 10 hours a day basically doing mule work. And they only got Christmas and the 4th of July off. And the town of McCarthy, which I'll show you later, was kind of like Sin City. That was a place where they could go and whoop it up a little bit. Um, I mean, it was it was brutal. No workman's comp or anything like that for the the workers here. Um, there's one story of a guy who was killed uh, in the mine. You know, it happened to a few folks because there wasn't really any OSHA back then, and uh, he got killed. And the mine officials notified his parents via telegraph, and uh, they reversed the charges. So it was a different world back then. And, you know, it was 1911, 1938, so kind of in the getting into the Great Depression, so people were pretty happy to have a $5 a day job. I can't remember all the buildings, but that is the hospital right there. And so the workers paid a little bit of their salary to get medical care. And I remember walk, going in that building, and you could still... Well, I'm sure they've taken them all out now, but we, we were able to see some medical records. And then up there was basically the manager's office. That's where well-connected East Coast man Stephen Birch, he's the one who bought up all the mining claims up here, and then um, ultimately the Morgan Guggenheim Syndicate was the ones that were responsible for developing this mine. The Morgans had the money and the Guggenheims had the, had the mining expertise. And about $200 million was uh, taken out of the mountain here. And that was the time of the robber barons and right before the progressive era. 
and uh, this pl this mine kind of played a, a role in Alaska statehood in a way. It's mentioned. It's, it's mentioned in the con the Constitutional Convention in Alaska, and Alaskans were realizing that a lot of their resources were leaving, and not much money was being pumped back into the state, and they used this mine as an example. All the mining, all you know, all the all the wealth just left Alaska. So in a way, it was almost like we were a, the state was a colony, and so it helped provide a little bit of context and impetus for Alaska to become a state in 1959. And here's a pretty good shot of the Bill building right down here below. Hopefully it won't collapse on me. It would be bad timing. That would suck. Anyway, Park Service is trying to, uh, spending a lot of money trying to stabilize this building. And they do have tours where you can go inside. And if you look over here, this is kind of where the trains loaded up the ore before heading down toward McCarthy and then toward Cordova. About a, I don't know, give or take 200 mile trip through um, down the Copper River, down along the Chitna River into the Copper, and then along um, Abercrombie Canyon and then out to Cordova where the ore was loaded and then processed even more into Coma. And here's a pretty good shot of the power plant right over here. And uh, at one point this burned down, but this is how they generated the massive amounts of electricity needed for this project. Another shot of the, the mill building. Very quiet in town right now. You know, if any of you are history buffs and you'd like to learn a little bit more, you might, uh, on my channel, you'll find a documentary that um, my students and I made back in 2008 called Bonanza. And it goes back to my days as a teacher. I'm a retired teacher. I worked for 25 years as a teacher in Alaska. And I always like doing interactive projects. And so I watched some Ken Burns documentaries and I was intrigued by those and um, motivated and inspired by those those documentaries that Ken Burns did, especially his uh, art of storytelling. And I thought, you know, with the right tools, we could do something like that. And uh, so we got a camcorder and armed with nothing but a camcorder and an attitude, we made a documentary about Kennecott Mine. And uh, it's kind of corny, kind of hokey, but it was a lot of fun. The kids still remind me about how much how enjoyable it was to this day. And then we went on to do two more documentaries. Those are also on my channel. One is about the Valdez Gold Rush in 1898, and then one is on the construction of the Copper River and Northwestern Railway. So, if you're intrigued, and if you have a sense of humor, and you can um, overlook some of our technical issues and uh, things like that, check them out. As I look around at this mill town, this work camp, I'm just kind of amazed at the incredibly brutal hard work these folks endured at that this time in history. I mean, Christmas and the 4th of July, that was it. The only time you got off. And I mean, you're in the mine and you're blasting copper ore, you're in this mill building. You probably don't even have a chance to really look around and realize how beautiful it is out there. And you'd certainly never had a chance to really enjoy it, go for a hike. Who would go for a hike? In those days, you probably just rested. So sometimes I, I feel spoiled and entitled. I've been working, you know, since I was 13 or 14, but nothing quite, nothing like this. You know, I haven't had to do, well, since I got into my late 20s, I haven't had to do brutal physical labor like these guys did. Anyway, just kind of kind of humbles you. 
makes me realize how lucky I am to be able to just come up here and enjoy this without having to beat my body for subsistence. Well, I'm uh, probably going to head out of Kennecott right now and go to McCarthy. The good news is it's about, I, I think it's like four or five miles, something like that. Five miles, let's just say five miles downhill most of the way. And so we'll go to McCarthy and see what's happening down there, which I can't imagine very much is happening. I haven't really seen a person since I've been here. Um, but we'll go to McCarthy and Sin City. downtown McCarthy and uh, I'll give you a little tour of, of McCarthy, McCarthy, Alaska. So there's lots of old buildings. This is the, I guess you would call, well, it says McCarthy Center and the general store. Good place to go. McCarthy. Not too much going on, as you can see. Actually, not anything going on. Um, Carthy has a couple of restaurants, a couple of really good restaurants, um, a hotel, a hostel. I think they have something resembling a bakery. And uh, what else? Oh, they have a general store and a couple of businesses that offer fly-in tours and backcountry, fly-in backcountry um, transport for people who want to go um, on treks and that kind of stuff. It's really, uh, right now it's very peaceful as you can see, but it's a fun place to hang out in the, in the summer. And you can catch a van to Kennecott here every half hour, hour, maybe it's every hour or so. Anyway, I've always liked McCarthy, just love to stop here again, full of young people full of life and energy and they like the outdoors and uh, just makes me feel young again to come here. Um, sure wish one of these restaurants was open right now. I could use a bacon cheeseburger. Actually, I couldn't, but I would, I would eat one anyway, so. One of the things about McCarthy that makes it unique is I think it's probably one of the most dog-friendly towns you'll ever see. You know, the outside dining, you'll see dogs just kind of hanging out. They seem to all get along. Burn gets a little intense, but it's a, it's a good opportunity for her to develop her social skills. Um, but anyway, yeah, you can, dogs can ride the vans um, into Kennecott, no problem. And uh, there was a little dog, a little husky named Kimmy up here who pretty much had the run of the town and would run run around and I think Kimmy had an owner but she was kind of the local favorite really cool dog um, but anyway if you don't like dogs you're not going to do very well in McCarthy it is you know Alaskans in general really really love dogs and uh, Flash and I are definitely no exception to that so kind of like the old saying if you 
you don't like cows, don't move into cattle country. And if you don't like dogs, probably shouldn't move to Alaska. Good morning, everyone. So it's about seven in the morning. And a beautiful morning. And uh, I'm ready to head back down the road. But that's about, give or take 60 miles or so, maybe a little less. And uh, nice and cool, cool this morning. So hopefully the roads will be iced. Got a little bit of uphill at the beginning. And then, uh, then hopefully it's gradually downhill. That's the way I, I expect it to be. So I'm expecting it to be a little easier on the way out, but we'll see. I feel rested and uh, ready to go. So looking back on a beautiful sunrise back on McCarthy. Nice quiet morning. Just how I like them. Well, you can see that um, bridge I just crossed. It's been around for a while, but in the old days, they didn't have the bridge and people had to cross over on a cable with a little, I don't know what you call it, cart or something like that that was on the cable. So people used to have to go over, over the river by hand. That's the Kennecott River behind me. Uh, Anyway, tough, tough people in McCarthy, tough and self-reliant. And uh, like I said, they really like their dogs. I wish I could have gotten some video shots, but I saw a couple of people on their snow machines with the dogs riding right in front of them. And that kind of testifies to the love of dogs in Alaska. Um, you can see it's a, kind of a gorgeous sunrise. Um, so why did I do this trip? This trip was a shakedown trip. Every spring I feel myself getting a little older and I have this uh, desire to see if I've got anything left in the tank. And one way to do that is to kind of put myself to the test, do something a little excruciating. And that's what this trip was about. Just like when you take a snow machine out and you just kind of open up the throttle and you want to see if there's any compression left in the, the engine, that's kind of what I wanted to do kind of sandblast my arteries, get my heart rate up, and uh, just take, see if there's anything left in the old boy. And what I realized on this trip, it was pretty tough coming in, 12 hours of biking through uncomfortable and annoying, con annoying country. I realized, you know what, I'm not 62 anymore. It's like my glasses are fogging too. <laughs> but. You know, if you've watched some of my other videos, you realize I've kind of adopted, you know, kind of adopted the words of the 103-year-old Adna Elder who said, it's important to choose an age and be it. Age is just a number. And if your heart is willing, maybe your feet will be too. So, um, anyway, got a little bit of a ride ahead and I'll catch, it, catch up with you in a bit. Here's the mud. Is it icy or muddy? It's pretty muddy. Oh. Well, you can also see that the mud redesigned my footwear. I've got some some earth tones. Oh well. Hard to live in wildly, I guess. 